century. The rest were professional groups along with college groups that were asked to form. And as usual, one of the things we try our best to do is make sure that we use the money as best we possibly can. And again, we uh, received for, and I want to say a number of years, more than 10 years in a row, the superior rating in the first in the state. This is our next big obstacle. We are growing fast, and you look around, and right now we're up to 39,000, really, today I checked and we're close to almost 40,000 students, a growth of about 1,600 students from last year. And if you look, this is the 2015, that's this time next year what we're projected, all the way up, and very quickly we are growing over 6,000 students in five years. And we are, we're crowded as it is. If you go to Atascacita High School, there is no room, and there's a thing called floaters, and that's where a teacher doesn't really have a classroom. They go from place to place. I think 23. 23. And 23 floaters right now that yeah. we're addressing. And, and, uh, and so their enrollment is right at 3,200, which is, is very, very close to their, their, to their capacity of the building. <coughs> We've got a lot of decisions to make in regard to the future with our facilities, and we'll be talking more about that in the next few weeks and months as we move forward with that. Well, on the next slide, it will show you that one of the things we're looking at, and the board has done a great job of this, they've used the money very wisely and worked with our demographic group to plan in trying to stretch the last bond election. We have 50, 155 million still in authorized bonds that are available. What we're going to try to do is make sure that we feel like we're going to need about six campuses over the next 10 years. One of those is a high school. We want to try to make sure that we buy the land. We don't think that we have the money with 155 to get all six schools, but one of the things that we're going to be looking at is how do we set the priority for that $155 million to stretch it as far as we possibly can and be efficient. And in this, as everything's going and changing very quickly with the uh, demographics and the housing growth, part of the, the op one of the obstacles we're going to have to face in this is that we're going to have to face the cost of construction that is going up. And we, we think that may eat a little bit into the 155. But in the past, we've worked with uh, PASA, that's our demographic group, and they've done a great job of guiding us in knowing where to build and where we're going to be growing it they've uh, helped us through this process. State Supreme Court now has the financial, the financial lawsuit, and this is the schedule as you look through. It should be going, I have a hard time reading this, argument for the Supreme Court in spring, and then depending on what happens, happens there, then the next steps, and you can see from the chart, and this is where you can miss Dr. Sconzo a lot because he's an expert. He understands what, what's going on, and, and he, if you don't know this, he was the first superintendent to testify. And he went through and explained our situation and our needs very well to the court. And finally, state legislature meets in the spring. We will be having the uh, Legislative Committee kickoff meeting Thursday, November 13th at 7 p.m. at the Tascacita High School Performing Arts Center. You're invited. We want to hear what you think that we need and also Representative Liberty will be there to speak and share what, what to expect. Very quick overview if you have any questions. Do I have time? This is a great audience. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Well, like I said, it uh, feels like even though this is our last one, school has just gotten started for the year. And I know a lot of great things are happening right here at Humble High School. And I just want to quickly, if I may, Dr. Nett, uh, seeing the ROTC reminded me of something I want to share with you that I'm very proud of. Uh, my brother was promoted to colonel uh, three weeks ago in the U.S. Army. And so, colonel, colonel Michael Mittag, he's uh, my stepbrother, some of you know our story and how we all came together as a family. Um, anyway, my mom did some research 
and to the best that she could find, there's only been two colonels from Humble. Uh, Mr. Kenneth, or Colonel Kenneth Knight from Humble High School as well, and uh, of course Colonel Mike Mittag, and both of them graduated from Humble High School in the class of 82. So, that's a... Uh, but I'd share that with you. So, and I know we have a lot more to come with the group that we're seeing come through and all the great things happening here at Omaha High School. So to tell us about that and a little bit more and give us an update on how the new year has started, please welcome Dr. Charles Ned. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I'd like to bring greetings uh, on behalf of our superintendent, our, our board of trustees, and welcome you all to Omaha High School. Uh, the best school in Omaha Independent School hey. District. Uh, one thing that I'm glad that Dr. Price had an opportunity to share was just some of the good things that's going on in the district as a whole because oftentimes what gets to you on the 10 o'clock news, it's the stuff that is shock and awe, the stuff that sells, the stuff that they want you to hear and paint a prank with broad strokes of something that's not have things that's not occurring that's, that, would look, that would put us in a negative light versus a positive light, but there are so many great and wonderful things happening here uh, at Humble High School and Humble ISD as a whole. Uh, so this is a great venue in which we can share those things with you all. And one thing that I've been doing is being able to present and showcase some of our student groups to you guys each time we have a BizCom. You just had an opportunity to see our ROTC kids. This is a program that has 147 students currently enrolled in it. And we have uh, you know, Colonel Rahm and Sergeant Major Watkins do a great job getting some students that may not necessarily know what their path is, helping them to understand that this is your place and these are some things that you're good at. These are some things that you may be able to look at as it relates to a career, but also just being able to promote some self-discipline for some of our students that need it. Um, for me, it's just great seeing the growth and development of programs because obviously when we opened the door here in August, you know, we, you know, we have over 1,600 kids here in this building and our largest group is our ninth graders and they walk in with their head down and, you know, trying to get from point A to point B, not really comfortable because their surroundings have changed and they're transitioning from the middle school campus to a campus that's three times the size of their middle school. So again, you know, purposefully, we do put supports in place to help them be successful as they transition to high school because there's a few things that's different for them. For starters, they need credits. They have to earn credits to move from one grade classification to the next. The other thing is they have to get accustomed to eight different teachers who are in eight different personalities in eight different ways sometimes in which they present information. And this is, <clears throat> this is one of those things in which it's learning by doing it. Because nothing that mom or dad tells them the night before school starts or prepare them for what they're going to discover, you know, during the course of the first few weeks, in addition to the entire 36 weeks of the school year. Um, our graduating class this year is approximately, as it stands today, 371. And we know that number, that number may decline just based on students taking care, not taking care of their business. But again, you know, we do put supports in place to work with those students as well. And the other piece that ties into just the, the overall group that ties it all together is the fact that, you know, we do have, you know, just in terms of give you a general idea of all the offerings that's available for students. Obviously, you know, we do have a lot of CAPE offerings, so, you know, our kids are going to leave out of here college or career ready. I spoke about the ROTC program, which, you know, for some, that would be a career when they leave high school, so going to the military. For others, you know, we do have <clears throat> cosmetology classes, we do have auto tech, where kids can leave out with the industry certification, ASC certification for auto tech, street certification for cosmetology. Um, Obviously, there's welding programs in the district in addition to culinary arts and other things that our kids have exposure to. Uh, but we also house an advanced academic program here that is unique to Umbra ISD and Harris County as a whole. There's a few other schools in Harris County that has it, but it's called International Baccalaureate. And right now, we have 116 kids in our International Baccalaureate program. And you get in the program as a junior and you continue as a senior. And what this does, it's, it's kind of like, you're familiar with advanced placement? 
Okay, and advanced placement, it's rigorous, rigorous curriculum. You have to test, you have to score three, four, or five to get credit. And most of most colleges will give you college credit once you pass it. Okay. IB, it's more or less along more along the same lines where you have to score four or above. And depending on the college that you choose to enroll in, they may give you credit for the course. But the key thing is that in in university language, in terms of looking at rigor of AP versus rigor of IB, they're more prone to provide credit to those students that have been taking the IB courses in spite of them possibly not <coughs> passing the IB test. But also, when it comes down to your Ivy League schools, uh, it opens more doors for those students because IB is viewed as a more college, is a more rigorous college preparatory. Uh, coursework curriculum that students will take and go in. And we had our first uh, Ivy Leaguer this past this past school year, uh, a student that was admitted and accepted a scholarship to Cornell University. And we have our first Bryce Owl. So you know we're very proud of that. And our students are doing a lot of great things. And I definitely want to utilize this forum to showcase that this has been great for me because I've had an opportunity to network with so many people here. And um, looking at looking around the room, seeing those familiar faces, and also, you know, new people that may be new to Humble Bizcom. I, I want to make sure that this isn't your last time coming. Um, you know, we they take pretty good care of us. You know, Scott does a great job of coordinating and keeping everything going here and his staff, and uh, we definitely welcome each and every one of you to the Humble Bizcom. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ned. Um, just want to say that I do very little to do this, so I, I want to give credit to the advisory team. And while uh, I see some of the faces here, Jamie, if I start naming names off, just wave your hand. If you're on the Humble Bizcom advisory team, please wave your hand. And uh, Tom, Tom, where's Tom Broad? I know there he is. Yeah. Uh, and then of course Stephanie Johnson, the Chamber, really puts all this together. So thank you and all the work that you do. So. Uh, November 4th is coming up, and there's a lot of things on the election, and one of them is the Lone Star College bond referendum, and uh, I would not be standing here today, I'm convinced of that, if it weren't for Lone Star College. Uh, we had, my parents had five, student, or five children in college at one time, and there's no way I could have gotten my degree if I could not have gone to a community college. And so, to tell us... All the great things happening at Lone Star College and a little bit about what the bond is going to have in it is Dr. Katherine Pearson, Lone Star College, Kingwood. Thank you, Scott. I'm curious, how many of here with a show of hands either have gone to Lone Star College, one of the colleges, or have family members who have gone? Okay. That's, this is just a microcosm of the impact this system has. And my job today is to inform you about this November 4th bond because it is a critical issue for all of us. This is how we looked when we first opened as North Harris County College back in 1973. This is what we look like now. So we cover over 1,400 square miles and serve a population of over 2 million, a population that we know will increase by a quarter of a million within five years. And just think about all the growth is, that is occurring. So we're not a small little place anymore. There are actually six separate colleges, and each college has at least one satellite center. So Lone Star College Kingwood has the Atascacita Center. And we're kind of evenly placed all around the system. This is how we get our money, because many think, well, you're state-supported. Well, actually, we used to get about 80% of our funds from the state. Now it's 23% and students pay 34% in tuition and fees that support their local community college or going to classes there. But the community, as a community, had voted to come into the college district via an ISD, and so the community picks up the majority of the taxes, and that's 36%. Now then, we're pennies on the dollar, so we're, we're really a great bargain. But this is actually how we get our funding. And you might notice of uh, the property tax, 41% is paid by business and commercial. So this is important uh, messaging for those that are in the business community. 
the 485 million tax, our 485 million bond that we're calling for in November will not have a tax increase. And you'll see how we do that in just a few minutes. But part of that is because we're growing at such a fantastic rate, we keep adding more properties, more businesses onto the tax rolls. But also, with any bond, we don't sell all those bonds, much like Umbles talked about, and build all that once. We do that over time, although um, we are rapidly growing. And we also have a AAA bond rating, which allows us to borrow at a very cheap rate. So those are important things for you to know. And then this is kind of the proof in that since 1999, we've had a tax rate, really, except for just two exceptions, right under 12 cents per $100 valuation. In the red is the M&O, maintenance and operation. That's the tax rate that actually supports salaries, the um, supplies, and what it takes to run a school. In the blue are the INS, interest and in sinking. That's the tax rate that supports buildings, actually physically constructing the buildings, selling the bonds, and equipping those buildings for the programs that will be in those um, in them when they open up, whether it's a nursing program or dental hygiene or whatever. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Lone Star College System Board lowered the tax rate 7%. That's quite phenomenal. Now, you know that we have nothing to do with your tax appraisals. That's appraisal district. So this ought to help offset some of that. So um, again, you can see just from the long history that uh, we have actually lowered taxes more than about seven times in the last 10 years. So this is what it means to a property owner. And of course, if you're over 65, your uh, taxes are frozen unless you do major improvements. And a lot of this is in the materials that is hopefully every one of you got. And if you didn't, we'll make sure that you get them. Uh, we can send them to you, deliver to you, because it's got all the information about the impact of this bond. We are really a bargain compared to most of the other community colleges in the state of Texas. There are 50 systems, and this is where our tax rate is. This is the state average. This looks at our enrollment, and much like uh, you've heard from the Humble School District, we are rapidly growing. So in 2008, when the economy started going south, we grew a tremendous amount at a, at a tremendous rate. We were very fortunate we had passed a bond then to accommodate that growth. Well, we're starting to pick up again now. We actually, in blue, are the credit students. Most of our students come to us taking credit courses, mostly to transfer, but quite a few are taking courses with us for workforce. The red are the continuing ed and the corporate college. So as a system, and this stat is from fall 2013, the only college system in the state that's larger than Lone Star is the Dallas system, and that was by a few thousand students. We are now, Lone Star College System now enrolls almost 83,000 credit students. So we're bigger than UT and A&M combined. We're a huge system. And we believe when the stats are finally certified for this fall, we'll probably be the largest in the state. We're very conservative in projecting growth. And this was done for the 2008 bond. And what you can see is that the projection in blue was that we'd only have 60,000 credit students by 2015. Actually, in 2014, we have almost 82,000 students. Lone Star College Kingwood now has 13,000 students. We grew 900 students from last fall. And think about what's coming down the Beltway with Generation Park, all those developments. Think about what's going north with um, the Grand Parkway and all of those developments. This is, again, fairly conservative, looking at the population in the, zip, in the Lone Star College system zip codes in red and then the credit students that came to us in the blue. So we know when the economy goes south, more and more people are taking advantage of their local community college where quality and we're cheap compared to universities. Actually, 75% of all freshmen start at a community college. And we are the number one college of choice. 
from all of our area high school seniors that graduate in May, one-fourth of them come into the Lone Star College system that fall. And that's 10 times more than go to U of H, six times more than go to A&M. And actually all together, and we have the state data, and I'll be happy to share it with any of you that would like, but about one-fourth to 40% of the high school graduates coming out of our area high schools come to the Lone, one of the Lone Star College System colleges. Only 22% go to other public colleges and universities in the state, and really only 3% at most, 2 to 3% go outside of the state or go to private universities. So we're still leaving anywhere from 30 to 40% of our high school graduates not entering into higher ed after graduation. And we know that what that means in terms of their earning potential, many of them will stay out for a year or two and then hopefully find their way back to a college because um, that does impact their economic well-being and as a parent, I know I didn't want my three at home for very long. I wanted them to get, get out there, get earning potential, and, and get on with things. So um, it all does matter. And I'm preaching to the crowd here when you know that we're in a knowledge-based economy and you need some kind of training, whether it's into a technical program or certificate program or to go on for a baccalaureate for earning potential. I think this to me is one of the most powerful slides in this presentation. When we look at the Lone Star College system, we know that we add over three billion in an economic impact annually because 91 to 95 percent of all of our students stay local. So when they get trained in higher skills, and by the way, you have a handout um, called Career Focus. That lists all of the workforce and technical programs, what the demand is for those careers, and what the starting salaries are. So except for a few minor, six, uh, minor exceptions, um, and they're very limited, drug abuse counselor, those, all the others pay really good salary. So we're starting after a two-year degree making from 50 to over 70,000. So those are the kind, when you come out as a dental hygienist, you're making well over 60,000 starting salary. And nursing is just right along there and many of the others. And we know that uh, we provide a lot of workers for our hospitals and other medical facilities. And if you have any questions on any of these, please let me know. I'm trying to go through these pretty fast. I have some time for questions. But this is why we're asking for support at this time. Um, we are getting close to capping classes. We know that within two more years we'll be out of space. And that's never good, especially when you see the growing population and who needs to get work for skills. We're certainly cheaper than the universities and the privates. And think about if you couldn't get um, a firefighter or a nurse or a car mechanic that was trained locally at an institution you help support as residents, what the price for those services and goods would be. And this actually shows that we don't overbuild when we're in a bond program. Um, what you see is the space in red and then the enrollments in blue. So if we didn't have that 2008 bond that allowed us to ramp up and put in facilities at six colleges, we could not have met that growth. And we know, again, what's coming. And just living in the area, we know that you know what's coming as well. So for just Kingwood, now there'll be facilities at all six colleges, and there'll be also some workforce satellite centers developed. But just at the Kingwood location, what this bond would mean would be a 60,000 square foot healthcare building. Right now our programs are in the bottom floor of this building and take up only 30,000 square feet, and we can't grow them. We're asked to increase our nursing program. Our dental, we have the only dental hygiene program in the state. We only take 15 students a year. We, the demand is much higher for dental hygienists. Same with respiratory and others as well as new programs. So whether it's Berkeley Eye Clinic wanting us to put in an ophthalmology program, and again, think about how, how many of us are aging and we're utilizing more and more of these services. So certainly our healthcare programs are some of our bigger employers in the area. 
Um, in addition, we knew that when we built this building, our student conference building, um, with the 2008 bond, it would not be adequate to meet the needs of students. So that's adding 10,000 square feet more so that they can have eating and study places. But in addition, we're looking, this is across the whole system, these advanced workforce centers. The 50,000 square foot one here, noted as process technology, that's a hot demand degree in the oil and gas industry. We're looking at building that somewhere out Beltway 8. And think about FMC and what's happening with Generation Park. So that's just one of many programs that we're tagging for that particular facility. But there are others all across the system. And this is the summary slide, and you should have this in your handout, in one of the handouts that indicate where that $485 million will be spent. So mostly on facilities for instruction, workforce, some renovation. Kingwood's 30 years old, North Harris is 40 years old, and it just takes a lot to replace roofs, to, to clean up facilities, and to be able to use them for another 30, 40 years. This doesn't, our trustee election doesn't impact many here. We're moving to individual single districts instead of at large. So these are in the more minority populated areas of Lone Star College System out by Cy Fair. So uh, unless some of you live there and the map is up on the website, if you do live there and you wanna know um, if one of these are in your areas to vote for them. So that's my story, and I'm here to take any questions if we have time, but I've kind of lost track of time, so Scott, any questions about any, any area of this bond proposal? This, we're at a critical point, because again, two more years we'll be capping classes. It takes two years at least to get a facility constructed. Yes, Sam. Did, didn't the Chamber Board of Directors vote unanimously to endorse this? Quite a few project? of the chambers have voted to endorse this um, effort. The, not only did the Lake Houston Area Chamber vote, the East Montgomery uh, Chamber voted to endorse this, and I know, um, and I don't have the list with me, but all across the district, they're voting to support this. And the Montgomery County um, Conservative Tea Party has endorsed it. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. So November 4th, everyone in this room most likely will see that on your ballot or you at your polling location. Uh, you know, last statistic I heard, and, and Representative Hubert, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the last statistic, statistic I heard on folks coming to Texas was 1,500 a week. And they get here, and of course they're surprised to know that our legislature only meets every two years. And that's why we do so well. So, <laughs> But, so the year that they'll meet is 2015, and that's coming up. And so uh, to tell us all about what's happening, and or will be happening in Austin, and some of the things that will affect us locally, and some things that I know will be on the ballot also on November 4th that he's going to tell you about, Please help me welcome State Representative Mr. Dan Huberty. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going into my third session now. Obviously, I uh, got elected in uh, 2010, and so this is going to be the 84th legislative session, but I uh, spent my first year uh, in office in 2011 when we started the session uh, dealing with a $27 billion cut. In funding, and so that made a huge impact uh, all across the state. Obviously, it impacted our schools, it impacted the hospitals, it impacted our community colleges, it impacted everybody. Um, and you know, as we as we tried to work through that, you know, there was the issue of coming out of the recession that we had, and and, and what was going to happen, and kind of where we're at. And the one thing we didn't do is we didn't go back and say, okay, we're going to spend all the money that we have in our bank account. We're going to we're going to raise taxes. We're going to do anything crazy that would that would stop or stagnate the growth of the state of Texas. And so we were the first uh, or the last state really to go into a recession, and the first state to come out of the recession. And we came out pretty quickly. We came out within about a two-year period of time. And so as we went back in the last legislative session, 
Uh, we had to pay some bills, some some bills that we uh, kind of had to defer a little bit. And so we had about a four billion dollar Medicaid bill that we had to pay last session. Um, we put some more money back into the education, the funding, um, and uh, uh, the Humble ISD guys know you know we're in the middle of a lawsuit. Thank God. The only thing that when I knew that I was a board president at the time when we actually engaged Thompson Horton, who was the lead plaintiff's attorney. And, you know, I'm all for him, you know, let's sue the state, let's sue the state. And then I got elected to be a legislator. <laughs> so Dr. Sconzo said to me, he says, would you, he, he, and he's very gracious, and he says, uh, they've asked us to be the, the lead plaintiff, so it would be humble, humble ISD, you know, versus the state of Texas. And I said, please don't do that. You know? <laughs> uh, but anyways, you know, I, I believe strongly that uh, the system is, um, it has an equity problem. Uh, you know, there's some debate on the funding sources, and, we'll tell you, and that'll 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 come out through the, the Supreme Court. And but we are going to deal with it. We are going to we have to we have to resolve the education system. And I think everybody agrees that this happens once every 20 years. So where are we at today? So as we go in, uh, the Susan Combs, who is retiring, and uh, there's, uh, we believe Glenn Hager probably will be the new controller as we go forward. But we're going to end up with about a 2.6 billion dollar surplus. Uh, so basically, we we have. Uh, a requirement in the state of Texas, we have to have a balanced budget. Unlike the federal government that spends money that they don't have, that we borrow from China or wherever we get wherever we get the money, we don't do that. We can't do that. It's unconstitutional. So our forefathers had some pretty good thought processes they went through and said, you know, you can't spend money that you don't have. Well, because we're doing so well in the state of Texas, and it's about a thousand people a day moving, not fifteen hundred a week, a thousand people a day moving in Texas, creating jobs. Because we're doing so well, we're having about two point six billion dollars more in the account than we thought. Um, and a lot of that's coming, obviously, from sales tax and people moving in, but because of the oil and gas business. Our oil and gas business is, is just kicking butt. Uh, you know, we produce about a third of all the natural gas in the country. When you think about that, it's about 21 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, and we're producing about 7 trillion cubic feet. And so we use about two, 2 trillion cubic feet, and then we ship the rest out. And so people are paying us for what we're producing in the state of Texas. Uh, obviously, we're creating a lot of jobs in that business. From a public education perspective, and I don't won't spend a tremendous amount of time because I think Tom talked about this, but you know, there's over 5.1 million kids in the state of Texas uh, that go into our public education system. Uh, we have about 1,100 school districts, roughly 1,128 school districts in the state of Texas, which is part of the problem that we have. Um, you have school districts because we're such a big state. Um, you've got schools, districts that have 13 kids in them. And so, you know, the teachers, the superintendent, you know, the guy that's the superintendent is also the teacher, the bus driver, and the coach, and everything else that goes with it, right? Obviously, here, we got 39,000 students. When I joined the school board, it's been now 10 years ago, I think we had 28,000 students. So think about that growth. And I was part of the board that, you know, we, we you know, talked about the bonds and how do we build schools and so on. What Catherine's talking about is real. Uh, that's a, that's an important thing, and it's important to be able to have buildings for, for our kids. And and so, you know, that's one of those things that we fought through as we, as we move forward. But, you know, we have more school districts than any other state that's out there. California has a few more kids, but we have more school districts that are out there. Um, 8,500 8, campuses, we have 650,000 uh, employees. And so they account for about 6% of all jobs that are out there. If you think about that, the significant economic driver that's out there is our school systems. As we move forward, you know, last session, uh, we had probably the biggest transformation in how do we educate our children. We passed a bill called HB5, and I think they talked a little bit about it. But basically what we said to ourselves is that we put, we put kids in a box. We said, this is what you're going to take, and this is what you're going to graduate with, and that's it. That's all you're going to be able to do. And everybody's got to take the same courses and do the same thing. Well, think about how our kids learn today. They learn so much differently than many of us, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago when we were in school. And so what we did is we said we want to create a graduation plan that somebody has the ability themselves to pick that plan. And, and we call it a, you know, it's kind of a foundation plan as you move forward. And you're picking a plan of what direction do you want to go. You're picking a path. And so we also uh, created what they call endorsements. So you can pick a business degree endorsement. You can take a STEM endorsement. There's a lot of different things that you could have done. Uh, but we're pretty proud of that, and we created a career and technical education uh, degree as we move forward as well. And part of what we were finding was is that the dropout rates, when we put these huge standardized tests in, we went from 15, by the way, we had 15 standardized tests. That's how many tests you had to take, standardized state tests you had to take to graduate from high school. 
went from 15 to 5. And I'm sure Trey appreciates the fact that we went to 5. And some of us thought we should just get rid of them all together, and we'll see that's going to be a fight we're going to have next session. But the business community feels like, you know, we have to have this test. And I look at it and say, well, don't we have the SAT and the ACT, and there's some standardized tests that we can measure how a child is doing. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that, you know, the business community believes that we have to have this. And if you, if you know anything about Austin, there's a lobby for everything. And there's somebody lobbying you to get something done for some purpose. So this was a good start uh, as we move forward. But in order for this all to be successful, the reality of this is that we've got to rely on our counselors. Because what's happening today is, is that we've got to make sure that that kid is picking a path and the counselors are out there making sure that those kids are out there. And I, does anybody have a child that's going, in, going into ninth grade or 10th grade right now? Okay, so um, we, my daughter just started ninth grade at her task casita. And so in eighth grade, they sat down with us and said, okay, here's the path that you have to go. Or this is the path that you can go, but you sit down as a parent and a counselor. And, and, it, and it, is, it, is, it is daunting when you think about it, you're saying to a 14 year old, okay, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Well, you know, you, but they get an opportunity to kind of pick and choose as they continue to go forward. You know, you really got to kind of lock in like your junior year roughly. But, you know, by that time, you know, most kids are, are, are comfortable with, they know where they're going. Uh, but we've got to address the lack of counselors. Have to address the lack of counselors. Uh, and that's going to be a funding issue. And I'm, I'm working on some legislation right now uh, to increase the funding formulas, so to speak, related to counselors, so the money can go into the system and they can they can use it for counselors or support of the students in some fashion. So that's going to be really important as we continue to go forward. They asked me to talk a little bit, I think Scott asked me a little talk talk about Proposition 1. Anybody know what Proposition 1 is on the ballot in November? Transportation. Okay. So there was about five hands out there. What is the biggest problem that we have besides, you know, let's say education in the state. What's, one, what's the number one big thing that we have here in the state? Of Mobility. Mobility, right? How many people are stuck in traffic? How about 1960, 5 o'clock uh, by Woodland Hills? Anybody ever get stuck in that traffic? Right? Okay, 59, the Beltway, all these other things. Opposition 1 uh, in Texas is very interesting. <clears throat> we have what they call the gas tax. It's 20 cents. Hasn't been raised since 1991. Uh, we have a problem in that gas tax, and then we have a diversion of a lot of that gas tax going to other areas. So the Speaker of the House, and with the, you know, potentially the new Lieutenant Governor, uh, Dan Patrick, have talked about we're going to end diversion, we're going to end part of these diversions. But that's only a small piece, that's about $900 million. We believe that the problem is about a $5 billion problem. We have a pay-as-you-go system here in the state of Texas. But what's happened is, is that because the funding has not kept up with the demand, and because we borrowed so much money, we're billions and billions and billions of dollars of debt. And I don't think people realize that. Billions of dollars in debts. Um, we now are paying more. The money coming in is just satisfying our debt service. That's it. So we're not using a dollar one for maintenance or any of those other things. And so it's, it's one of those cyclical functions, right? You know, you ever, you ever find yourself at some point you know, on your credit cards where you keep, you, you keep paying and keep paying and keep paying and you're trying to pay it down, trying to pay it down, and the interest rates are too high and you just get in that, that vicious circle. And so what we said was, okay, with all this oil, and, remember I talked about the oil and gas revenues that were coming, with all this money that's coming into the system, it's going into what we call a surplus account, or the rainy day fund. They call it the economic stabilization fund, but you probably heard of it as the rainy day fund is what we have. <clears throat> and we have, as we continue to go in, we, we should have probably around $8 billion uh, in that when we start the 2015 legislative session. And I'm, I'm going to be a little political and a little partisan here for a second. But in 2011, when we made all the cuts that we made, my colleagues on the and obviously most of you guys know I'm a Republican, right? So um, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle said, oh my God, you know, the, the building's going to burn down, everything's going to fall apart, this is going to be awful, and I love my school people. But, you know, I have a hard time when school districts have $12 billion, with a B, $12 billion in their fund balance accounts, and the state only has eight. Now, part of it is because we've mandated some of that. But colleagues in 2011 were saying, let's spend all the money. Let's spend every dollar that we have. How many people in their own households have money in their savings account? Everybody should have their hand raised, right? 
How many people, if you got into trouble or something happened, would spend every dollar that you have in your savings account? Exactly. And that's why we didn't spend the money. And that's why we now have money in the account so that we can actually do something with it and we can do something with the roads. And it was a tough decision. It was very difficult. I remember talking to Dr. Scanza during that session saying, look, I know this is, you, you guys are not going to be happy about this, but this is the right thing to do as we move forward. We've got to recover. The, 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 the system has to recover. And just pumping money into it is not a conservative, fiscally responsible thing to do. But what we're able to do is last session, uh, we created what they call Prop 1. And Prop 1 is a constitutional amendment that you will get to vote for, hopefully you'll vote on November 4th, that you'll get to vote for that provides for the use and dedication of money transferred to state, from state highway projects. It's pretty simple. What we're doing is we're saying 25% of the oil and tax revenues will go towards public education. Money that's going into the stabilization fund today that's ballooning that account to $8 billion. So as we go forward, and we're going to put a, we're going to put a floor, a cap, uh, or that's the intent, is that we're going to put a cap on the rainy day fund, meaning we can't go below that because natural disasters or anything else that happens, we've got to be responsible, we've got to have money in the account. But 25% above that will be split evenly um, between the economic stabilization fund and the highway fund. And we believe that if that happens, it's projected to increase funding by $1.4 billion a year. Now, we're still going to be short, but the point of it is, is that we want to get into a pay-as-we-go system. We've got to be able to maintain our, our facilities and our highways. Uh, and we're trying to reduce debt along the way. And part of it is, is that if we can reduce debt, if we can pay down our debt, that'll create more money that can go back into the system. Instead of paying for something or paying for debt, it'll allow us to go back into the system. I sit on the Select Committee for Transportation uh, this session. We've had nine meetings so far. I think nine meetings. Some, it seems like nine meetings. Um, talking about all these different ideas. Um, and I'll give you one that just caught my eye, and I'm filing a bill on this. I found out that, and I don't, you probably don't know this, but when you register your car in Harris County, there is a $6 fee that you pay to register your car. Anybody know what that's for? It's what you would call cash for clunkers. <coughs> It's called the LIREP program. It's a low income reduction, uh, emissions reduction program. And basically what you can do, if you've got a car that's more than 10 years old or it's got emission problems, you can get it fixed, the state will pay for it. I, I was shocked when I started listening to this. Or you can trade your car in and they'll give you 3,500 bucks for a new car. Now, Harris County generated $20 million last year, or in the last, uh, last year, so they're generating, I think it's like 20, in that right, Casey, something like that. It's about $20 million a year. $40 million over the last two years. Any idea, and that money's supposed to come back into Harris County. Any idea how much of that money came back to Harris County? I know you don't. How about, how about $2 million? How about $2 million? So what I said is that, okay, let's put it back either, we're going to either use it in Harris County or we're going to stop the fee. One of the two as we go forward. But we're using it right now. It's just going in to certify the budget. But there's all these little things that are happening in the state when you start, you know, peeling the banana back a little bit <laughs> and you start seeing what's in there, it's really shocking uh, of what's happening and what the fees are being used for that they weren't, you know, the intended use of these fees are not being used for that. So that's part of what we're looking at as well as we go forward. So if you add the 1.4, we think there's about another billion in diversions and all these little things that are out there, it's, it's pretty significant. The transportation facts, I think we've talked about this, you know, um, we need $270 billion in highway investment in the next 25 years. I mean, it's just, it's just a fact. You know, that is an undisputable fact. And so, uh, as we continue to grow as a, as, a, as, a, as a state, as we continue to have more and more people that are moving here, this is a very serious problem. This is a very serious problem. Um, we have 80,000 highway miles uh, that we have to take care of. Uh, we're 38th in capital and spending. We have the most bridges of any state. Obviously, we're a huge state, right? Most bridges of any state. We have 7,500 that are basically obsolete, can't drive on them, because we don't have the money to fix them. And so part of Proposition 1, again, you know, Scott talked about it, I know Catherine talked about it, is that, you know, voting is, is critical. I think early voting starts October 20th. What? October 20th. Last day registers October 6th. It's in that vicinity somewhere there. And, and the elections on November 4th. So it's going to be important if, you, if, you can, if you're interested in your roads and as we go forward. And again, this is, we are not raising taxes. Not a single increase to a tax dollar. We're just, we're just taking the money that is coming in, that's being generated through the oil and gas revenues. And by the way, 
those oil and gas revenues, they have to have trucks to transport their, their fuel. They have to have trucks to transport the water and all the other things. And these, those, those vehicles are tearing up these roads. These vehicles are tearing up those roads, and so it's getting more critical as we go forward. So um, as, as we move into the next session, you know, I'm going to have a, you know, and we communicate, and if you want to go to our website, danhuberty.com, we have a, we have a, a monthly update or weekly update. I think we're going back into a weekly update. And typically what we do is we report back on what's happening in the legislature. Uh, we'll have our legislative packet that will be ready in about a month that we're going to put out there and let people comment on. Um, and if you have ideas or the things that are out there, because a lot of the ideas we get on legislation comes from our constituents and our community. Um, and so we're happy to help, and that's, that's part of our goal. Um, so, last, uh, last year, uh, 75 to 76% of the people voted for the water plan. Uh, that was huge. Um, so we've worked hard to resolve the water plan. We're working on the funding transportation. We've implemented House Bill 5, and we're going to continue to look at how do we improve education in the state. Uh, we're making sure that we have economic benefits. Uh, that are out there and, the, and, and making sure that we're spurring economic growth, which is what the chambers do. You know, chambers are really important. I was with Charlie yesterday and we are talking about, you know, how do we continue to grow in our areas? And then obviously securing our border with Mexico. It's critical. It is absolutely critical. Before I finish, and I'll be happy to take questions, um, we uh, went down and, you know, they talked about the children and it is, it's a huge problem that's down there. Um, but we were down and we did a mission one night um, in uh, part of our guard unit, in a period of an hour and 10 minutes, we ended up catching 20 illegals or helping the border patrol agents catch 20 illegal uh, immigrants. The night before that we were down, they caught about 15 more with 1,200 pounds of pot. So it is a real problem. These are not nice people that are coming into our country. These are criminals that are coming into our country. And I support what the governor's doing uh, and funding it because our federal government is not willing to do that. And so we put about $180 million into the budget last session uh, to, to deal with that. Right now, we're spending somewhere around uh, $20 million a month uh, to $25 million a month on additional security. Uh, but it's, it's not going to get any better. And, and we've got a serious, serious problem. And it impacts schools, it impacts hospitals, it impacts everything. Uh, the, the cost associated with it is huge. Um, so we're going to deal with that as we go into next session as well. So that's it. Happy to answer any questions. Really? You explained that very well. Actually, I just want to thank you for the effort that you're putting forth in the changes with the diplomas for the kids. The, there have been a lot of good changes, and I personally appreciate that. Good. Thank you. Yeah. And we got, you know, there's more to do. And, and we listen. You know, that's the important thing is we have to listen and get, get it right. We have one, you know, you got, you got one chance to get it right sometimes and you don't want to screw it up, so. Anything else? No? Yes, ma'am. What is House Bill 5 again? HB 5 is a, it was what we call an ominous bill, which means that it's about that thick. Um, and, uh, but it's got a lot of different things in it. But it was really education reform, reduce the amount of testing, created the graduation requirements. Um, you know, there was, there was a bunch of things that were in it, but really the meat of it was, you know, reducing the amount of standardized testing and creating the foundation program and, and the distinguished program for students to be able to graduate in, in the state of Texas. So it really changed the way that, you know, we took our TEKS, which is the Texas Essential Knowledge Skills criteria, and we put it in and we made sure that it was broadened so that people could pick their path. Anything else? House Bill 5 also worked, uh, mandated that school districts work with their education, um, their higher ed components. Right. So we really have a true transition from when a student completes high school being college ready right. instead of having this gap. Right, absolutely. Did you have some oh, it's, oh, by the way, um, one last thing. Uh, I'm on the ballot, so if you want to vote for me, that'd be great. I don't have an opponent, but that's okay. Still vote for me. Um, <laughs> Early, we got an early, I, I talked to Stan Stannard, um, you know, we only had a couple early voting locations here in, in our area, even one up in Kingwood, which seems to like change every single time, and I talked to him about that, and the one in Humble, and then there was one in Crosby. We got an extra one, uh, I asked him, I said, this is ridiculous that we don't have it, so we got one in a task to see it. it's on Westlake Houston Parkway at the Houston Northeast Houston Baptist Church. So you can, if you doesn't matter where you live, but you can vote in any of these early voting locations. And so I think that's going to be great uh, for the community to be able to have that. So, thanks, guys.
Thank you, Dan. We are truly blessed to have such a great friend of our district and community being right here and being in Austin helping us. So thank you again, Dan, and thank you, Casey, for all y'all do. As we mentioned, uh, you've seen from Dr. Pearson and, and from Dan Huberty, and I uh, talked about earlier, November 4th is the election day. And, it, and this still uh, blows people away when I tell them this, but uh, you, other than those items, all 435 members of Congress are up for election across the entire country and 33 senators. And that happens every two years. And 33 more senators falling to the, the remaining 30. Two, I guess it would be after that, or 34, whatever that is, uh, on this every two years. So, elections have consequences, so please exercise your right to vote. We love Ted Poe. And Ted Poe, yes. Is he, 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 yeah, I was going to ask myself if he's on the ballot. He said there are all 435 are on the ballot. So, yes, Ted Poe will be on the ballot. I don't think he has a, an opponent. Right? Yeah. He does. So, um, that's right, he didn't have one in the primary. But, yes, so he does have an opponent, so please don't take anything for granted. Get out and vote. And as I mentioned, our sponsor today is uh, Memorial Herman, and they also have an announcement to make about their orthopedics uh, program. So, Vivian. Thank you very much. Ms. Vivian Bond from Memorial Herman. Well, there's been a trend today talking about um, elections and, and also about education. So I'm not going to break that trend, and I am going to talk a little bit about what Memorial Hermann Northeast um, does for our education system, for our kids who are, um, who are student athletes in, in, in our community. And with that, I'm going to talk about our sports medicine program, uh, sports medicine and orthopedics, um, orthopedics program. Um, for those of you who have students um, in the school district, you may have seen us regularly out on uh, Friday nights, Saturday mornings, Thursday nights at our local um, local high school football games. Um, Memorial Hermann Northeast is the official athletic um, sponsor for Humble ISD, and with that, we offer um, a lot of services to, to our student student athletes. Um, kicking off the football season, um, we have our athletic um, outreach trainer, Robert Maniscalco, who serves as a liaison between the schools uh, that we serve, um, our physicians, um, and any kids who, kiddos who are, uh, who, who are injured. Um, in addition to that, we provide football coverage. We have a physician on the sidelines of every home and away game for Humble High School, Atascacita High School, as, as well as Summer Creek High School, and I'm going to introduce some of our physicians who volunteer their time to, to do that um, in, in just a couple of minutes. In addition to that, if you have a student who's injured at any one of those games, our physicians open up their clinic on Saturday mornings so that you can get your kiddos in and seen by an appropriate physician and hopefully get them returned to play as quickly um, as quickly as, uh, as quickly as possible. So that addresses, um, that addresses football season. Um, outside of football season, um, our physicians also make training room rounds to the local high schools. They come in, they evaluate injured athletes, uh, and they again help them, help them return to play whether they're playing football, soccer, volleyball, swimming. I did hear the first concussion of the year at Summer Creek High School was in swimming. Um, so um, you never know when when your kiddos are are, are going to need um, going to need a great great physician, great provider to help them help them remain healthy. Um, we also do impact testing. Um, we have a physician who is who's a concussion expert on our team, Dr. Sean Weaver with UT Orthopedics. Um, in the event your kiddo has um, has a head injury, which hopefully that doesn't hurt, that uh, doesn't happen. Um, Dr. Weaver will see your, your kiddos during the week, go to, training, go to the training room, help assess, um, help assess those students. We also provide impact, uh, impact testing, which is a baseline test um, for kiddos um, who, who play um, contact sports. We provide that to all five of the high schools in Humble ISD as well as the, as well as the middle schools. Now, obviously, that's kept us busy, um, and because that has kept us so busy, we're really, really proud to announce the fact that we're expanding our program, and we've added two new physicians um, to, to join our, uh, our sports medicine and orthopedics team. As I say that, we've, we've also added a primary care physician in, in, in Kingwood. Uh, Dr. Hodges, if you'll stand up and, and, and wave, and I mentioned Dr. Hodges. <laughs> 
because he has helped out with some of our sports coverage as, as we as we've needed him. But um, we've also added two new two new orthopedic surgeons, and we're really really proud um, to have these um, these guys on our uh, on our team. And I'm actually going to ask them to come up and, and join me for just a minute, um, Dr. Michael Cusick. Um, who has joined us, um, joined us from, from Florida, um, and then Dr. George Azude. And I don't know if I've actually sent this to, to Dr. Azude, but we, we're um, starting um, our, our own breeding program for talented orthopedic surgeons. <laughs> Dr. Azude was born um, at our Memorial Hermann facility in the medical center, <laughs> and we will stay away, so we brought him back. <laughs> talk about themselves for a minute rather than you have to listen to me any anymore. Um, but I do want to mention that both of these physicians have a tremendous amount of sports related experience. Um, both of them have served as uh, team physicians for, for professional sports teams. Um, Dr. Cusick has served as a team physician for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, Dr. Azude has served alongside Dr. Walt Lowe, who you may know the name. He's the head team physician for the Houston Texans. Um, Dr. Azude served along um, the sidelines uh, as team physician for him. So these are your two newest Humble ISD team physicians. And Dr. Cusick, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. So my name is uh, Michael Cusick, and I uh, went to the University of Texas at Austin some time ago. So this is kind of coming back full circle for me uh, to Texas. As she said, I went to medical school in Louisiana. I went to, uh, I did my training in uh, Memphis, Tennessee at Campbell Clinic, and then I did a specialized year of shoulder and elbow surgery training in Tampa, Florida. We were the team physicians for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the uh, New York Yankees spring season since they do their spring training there. Um, and I'm coming back to join the team with Dr. Zazude and, um, <clears throat> and Dr. Federer, who specialize in sports medicine. Uh, I specialize in a little bit more upper extremity, that, and these guys know the knee a little bit better than me, but as a team, we see everything, and we're happy to see anybody uh, in this area. We're committed to the community to help in any way that we can if you have any musculoskeletal injuries that we can help you with. So, thanks. So, as Vivian said, I was actually born in Herman Hospital back when it was called just Herman Hospital. Um, I moved to New York when I was about four years old, so I did grow up in New York. I did my undergrad at St. John's University in Queens, New York City, and then I went out to Chicago and, and started my training in medicine out there. I did medical school and residency at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Came back to Houston uh, to do my fellowship with Dr. Lowe, so we got a great opportunity. We had a great opportunity to cover pro teams throughout the Houston area. We, not only did we do the Texans, but we also did the Rockets, the Astros, and the Houston Dynamo as well. We, in addition, we uh, helped cover all the uh, athletic department of the University of Houston, and I and I probably my greatest experience uh, from that fellowship year was covering a uh, high school, uh, St. Thomas High School, where I kind of got to be uh, the the main focal point. I didn't have all my attendings and my bosses kind of looking over my shoulder. So that was one of the highlights I, I would say of uh, my fellowship year. So definitely getting this the opportunity to come to the uh, humble area and, and serve the high schools in this area and the community as well has is, is, is been an honor and I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to, to serving the community. Team. I did see Kevin Williams out here somewhere. If you haven't been introduced to the Lake Houston experience, um, we are anticipating some, some great announcements and partnerships um, with the Lake Houston experience and our, our team physicians um, as well. So if you have any questions for these guys, they're here. They're going to be um, they're going to be around um, after the event. Please feel free to tap into them as well. Thank you, Vivian. It's such a great to have uh, Memorial Herman right here in our, our back backyard and uh, all the things they do for our community and, of course, the health uh, providers that they have there. It's just fantastic. So thank you again for being here, and thank you again for being our presenting sponsor today. I bought my first car. I actually didn't buy it. I put a little money toward it, but my grandparents helped me mostly buy my first 1983 Mustang convertible from what was then Frontier Ford. And it's now uh, Planet Ford, and um, 
Christy was uh, going to show us a, a slideshow, but she had some trouble with her flash drive, and so we won't have the pictures, but I actually think it was a marketing ploy, because now we're all going to be so curious of what it looks like over there, we're going to go by and visit Planet Ford, so. Does it look like that? <laughs> anyway, I had a chance to visit it, and it is absolutely beautiful, And uh, but I'm going to let her tell you all about that and all the great things and that are happening at Planet Ford, and all the great things they do in our community, not just with providing great service with a vehicle, but for all the other things they do with Humble ISD and all the other charitable organizations. So, Christy Williams with Planet Ford. I think he needs a new expedition. Uh, well, to give a, if, if, if any of you have driven down the 15 iron corridor, you've seen the construction going on throughout the dealership. We have uh, opened up the lot and our new inventory is about 3,400 vehicles. That's what I have on the property today. Uh, we've remodeled both uh, buildings. They're totally renovated and then we've opened a restaurant where our service drive used to be is a full service restaurant. So you can get hamburgers, hot dogs, pizza, chicken, buffalo wings, you name it, you can get it. So it's, uh, it's, it's been an experience. So. Uh, it's a design, it's called Cruiser's Cafe, and it's designed for 50 years of Mustang. So when you come into the restaurant, the walls are covered with uh, digitally enhanced tiles. The ladies' restroom is a 69 Boss 429, because Ooh, I picked that wow. one. <laughs> and the men's restroom is a 50th anniversary, because Chuck turned 50, so he got the bathroom. <laughs> so uh, the floors are digitally enhanced. The countertop is a 64 Mustang Fastback. <laughs> The, uh, the end of the counter is the front. The back panels of the walls, I had a flash drive, but I couldn't get it to work. There's one color panel for every year of every Mustang ever built. So on the wall, you see the paint code, the color, the, everything is, is on the wall. So if you have time, come by and see it. One of the new things that we're doing is we're breaking ground in the next probably two months on a new 16 bay quick lane north of Kingwood. So that's a new project that we're doing in conjunction. Uh, we're building some apartment complexes for the Village Learning Center. So that's something that's coming up in the very near future. So other than that, that's all I got, Scott. Thank you, Kristen. But it, it is absolutely gorgeous facility, and so and again. Thank